Thank you, Robin. Thank you all for joining us today for the webinar Navigating the Tenure Track, which is hosted by the Cochrane Strategies Interest Group of SMS. My name is Anke Herfeld. I'm from the University of in Vienna. Uh, Sorry, I am from BU, Vienna University of Economics and Business. I moderate today's webinar with Audrey Ruhre from University of Montpellier. We are the engagement ambassadors of the Cooperative Strategies Interest Group of SMS. And together with our engagement officer, Professor Hans Frankfurt from City University of London, we organize today's session. Our speaker today is Fabrice, Professor Fabrice Lomino from the University of Hong Kong. He very successfully navigated already the tenure track at the university, and he will share some common challenges that arise when being on the tenure track and share insights on how to develop a research agenda, how to approach teaching and services, what about time management, who should be your external referees, and what the tenure track package should all be about. A few housekeeping details before we get this session started. We have the chat activated where you can post all your questions and Audrey and I will monitor the chat and then ask your questions during the Q&A part of this webinar. This webinar is recorded and will be later shared on the website, on the YouTube website of the SMS channel. Without further ado, thank you Fabrice for being here today with us and sharing all your insights. It's a great, great pleasure to have you with us. The virtual floor is yours. So let me share my screen. Okay, can you can you see the, the, the slides? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. Well, hello, hello everyone, and uh, thank you, thank you for being here today. I, I don't know if I should say good morning or good evening or good night, but I would like to to thank you, Anne Catherine, for the introduction, Audrey and Hans, and as well as the SMS office for for organizing this uh, this workshop. So my name is Fabrice Mino. I'm currently at the University of Hong Kong, where I just started, like just a few days ago, at, uh, as, a, as a professor in, in strategic management. I was previously at the University of Purdue uh, in the US, where I got tenure and then become, uh, became associate professor. And I also worked in, in Switzerland and, and Australia after my PhD. So today, I will try to help you navigate the tenure track. So, or more precisely, I will be your guide on the tenure track. <laughs> and I think it's useful to know in advance uh, the challenges and hurdles you're likely to face as a junior faculty, okay? So uh, junior faculty members have to deal with a lot of confusion, much uncertainty, much confusion. Uh, usually, you know, you start a new phase in your life uh, with a new job in a new location. So you're likely to deal with high stress. Okay, uh, so for instance, you have to deal with poorly defined work role boundaries, perpetual time pressures, work overload, high self expectations, and so on and so forth. So the first few years after your PhD are often a difficult and, and very stressful time. So even though in, in most schools there is no formal set of objectives like, oh, you need uh, five top publications to get tenure, it's useful to get an understanding uh, as much as possible uh, of the expectations at your new school. There are many differences across institutions about how you should, what, what you should do actually to, to be promoted and, and, and get tenure. So let, let me give you a few examples. So for instance, what is the respective weight of teaching, scholarship and services? And as, as we'll discuss, there are many differences across schools regarding the balance between uh, research, teaching, and services. Are there some other expectations, like mentoring, getting grants, and, and uh, as I can further explain, in some countries, like for instance, getting grants is very important. What is your school definition of a top journal? And again, like depending on schools, there, are, there, are, there is a lot of variance, you know, in some schools, there is an internal list. In some other schools, they are using the University of Texas Dallas list like with a list of 24 journals in management. In many schools, especially in Europe, they are using the financial time list as the official list of the top journals where you should be, where you should publish, okay? Uh, is it expected to have some solo publications? In some schools, it doesn't matter. In some of the schools, it's, it's critical. Uh, it's really something that you must have if you want to have a, a chance to get tenure, okay? Also, some other important factors, for instance, are there any specialist journals uh, that are valued at your departments? Uh, for instance, research policy, if you're in an innovation-focused department, okay? 
So while you are going to face a lot of conflicting demands in the next few years, getting a sense of these expectations may help you define priorities. It's also very useful, of course, to, to discuss with your colleagues who have recently been tenured to understand what have been the standards in the recent past. Okay. So, um, and, and to get a good understanding of these expectations, it's critical to read the department culture because many expectations are informal. In this regard, I think it's important to learn about the assumptions, the rules, the, the understandings of your colleagues, for instance, by observing how they interact or by reading between the lines. Uh, in some schools, there is an official mentoring program. And if it doesn't exist at your school, you should try. You should still try to get a, a mentor. I think it's a, it can be very helpful, you know, precisely to decipher the rules of the game in your, in your department and in your school. Another critical source of, in, of information is the, is the administrative staff. Uh, some of them have been there for a while, sometimes like 20 years, uh, and they sometimes know a lot about the way things work. And, and sometimes also they may have some unspoken power in, in your department. So you don't, you, you should, uh, you should not undervalue the, uh, the administrative staff. Okay. So one way to, to think at the, uh, at, the, at the tenure packet is a bit like a super job market packet. So at most universities in, in the US or in research oriented schools in, in Asia and Europe, you will have to apply for tenure at the end of your fifth year. Okay, so once you start as a rookie, usually, you know, at the end of the fifth year, you will have to, uh, to submit your packet and, 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 and start the, uh, the tenure process. Uh, so in your uh, tenure packet, uh, you have to put all your articles, of course, working papers, teaching evaluations, syllabi, research statement, teaching statement, description of your service activities, and so on. So for instance, in my case, it was uh, more than 1,000 pages which is not unusual. You know, it's a, it's a big document. It's time consuming to prepare uh, such a package. And a single, uh, but I think important piece of advice is to keep record in a, on a regular basis in a systematic way of all your accomplishments in each category, even starting ideally as a PhD student, you know, be very systematic, but okay, I've been to, that, to this conference, I've been a reviewer for this journal and so on and so forth. So you can do that with a good old <laughs> file organizer or with an Excel document, it's up to you, but I, th I think it's, uh, it can be very helpful and, and it can save a lot of time when you, when you do this work on a regular basis, you know, starting on day one when you, when you start in your, in your new job. So, uh, something else uh, you should be aware of <laughs> is to develop your research agenda uh, or, or to develop your research around a specific agenda. After five or six years, when you have to summarize your research activities, you should be able to present in a simple way what you have done. Uh, so think of the connection between your different projects. How do your projects try to deal with the same big issue? Uh, what do you want to be known for? What's your identity in the field, in strategic management or, or any, any sub-discipline in management? So it's much more difficult to develop a reputation uh, on a specific area when you have dispersed papers. Uh, at the same time, having a research agenda has some of the benefits, like it, it may help you identify future projects and to make a selection between different projects. And again, my, my advice uh, is to start paying attention to this issue as a PhD student, or as early as possible uh, as an assistant prof. And, and uh, if I try to, to remember my, my own situation, I think it's something I, I was not fully aware when I, when I started as an assistant prof, like to really to develop my research around a specific agenda, okay? And one way to, to think about it is with the gardening metaphor. And ideally you want to have a research agenda, which looks more like a French garden than a jungle. And I'm not saying that because I'm French. <laughs> Uh, getting a French garden requires a lot of efforts and attention, especially you need to prune a lot. Uh, you need to make some choices, sometimes hard choices. Sometimes you have the opportunity to start a new project, but you have to make a choice and, and, and be selective in the new project you're going to start. Okay, uh, You have to stay focused on one or two big overarching issues and ignore the rest. Okay, It will be for later on. <laughs> Once you get tenure, basically, you, you know, you can and start new directions and uh, new lines of research. But during your tenure years, I think it's, it's, it's critical, you know, to be focused and to develop an, an identity around one or maybe two big ideas, okay? 
So to illustrate the importance of a, of a research agenda, let me illustrate with my, uh, with my own research. Uh, I would say that my own research is organized around two main topics and the intersection between these two topics. Uh, so as you can see on this slide, there is a purple box, which is really my PhD dissertation. And as an assistant prof, I, I worked and I focused on two related areas in blue and in red here as a direct extension of my dissertation. It means that uh, I, I, I might have worked on some other projects and, and sometimes very interesting with fascinating data with uh, very good people, but it was a bit my guideline. Okay, every time I start a new project as an assistant prof, how does it fit here? Okay. So in addition to uh, listing uh, your publications and writing your research statements, you should also pay attention to other aspects of your research activity, activities such as research awards, uh, like best papers or nominations for best papers, maybe at the SMS, <laughs> uh, internal grants, external grants. Uh, for instance, in, uh, in Canada, in, uh, in Australia or Hong Kong, it is much valued to receive a grant. And there are many national programs where you can get a specific grant as a, as a junior scholar. So it's sometimes like very, very important to get a grant uh, during your tenure track. You can also report your number of citations, even though I think it's usually not something which is very important or critical as an assistant prof. I think it's, uh, it becomes more important for the next step when you try to become like a full professor. You can also list uh, if you have been a reviewer, especially for, for top journals, uh, if you are a member of some editorial boards, if you have organized a session at AOM or SMS or any other conference, or if you have organized a symposium or, and, and so on. Okay, so again, when you think about your research activities, it's not only about your, your publications in, in top journals. It's, it's really a portfolio of activities. So something else which is very important in the, in the, for the tenure process is that you will have to provide a list of referees. And those referees, they will have to write a letter about your research. And the relative importance of uh, internal reviewers versus reviewers external to university can be very different across schools. In the, in the best schools, the role of external reviewers will be very, very important, okay? While usually in non-research oriented schools, like more teaching schools, the tenure decision will be mostly made internally by, by, your, by your colleagues in your department or maybe in your school. Okay, so depending on schools, uh, the number of names uh, you should provide is also different. Uh, for instance, again, if you are in a research-oriented school uh, or institution, you should usually suggest between five and 10 names of potential referees. Then your department is also going to contact some, uh, some scholars on this list, plus some other scholars of their choice, okay? So, you should also be aware that most of the time you are not allowed to contact your former supervisor or your former colleagues uh, where you worked before, where you get you where you got your PhD. Uh, you, and sometimes also you you can only nominate full professors and, and also sometimes only from a specific list of schools, like only good schools or schools which are at least as good as your own institution. Okay, so it's also something you uh, you, you should know and uh, you know who can be the potential referees for, for, your, for your tenure packets, okay? Then your referees will have to, to comment on how you compare with the other candidates who got the PhD the same year as you did, you know, uh, comparison with your cohorts. Uh, let's say like all the people who got the PhD in uh, 2018, how do you compare, you know, uh, with, with the other candidates, okay? Also applying for tenure the same year. And they also have to comment if your research is, is interesting, impactful in your, in your discipline. Okay. In your tenure packet, you should also uh, present your teaching activities. So I think here it's pretty straightforward. For instance, you have to put your teaching evaluations, which courses you have taught, uh, which new courses you have developed, uh, whether you have developed some teaching material, like some videos, or especially during the, the COVID time, or maybe you know some case studies. Again, depending on schools, you know sometimes it's very important. Sometimes it has basically no value. And, and you can also, you know, put in your packet uh, any user evidence of teaching success. It can be emails of students, uh, colleagues who, who attended one, one of your, your courses, and, uh, and maybe they can say a few, a few nice things about your teaching style. 
So it's you know some pieces of evidence that you can put in your in your packet for for the for the teaching part. Okay. The third dimension on which you uh, you will be evaluated are the services. Uh, here you will need you will need to list uh, on which committees you have served, and many people will tell you that services are not important. Uh, maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> uh, let me explain. I think uh, it's important to keep in mind that. It's mostly during during services for your school or for your department or for your university that you will work with colleagues who in turn will have to decide on your tenure case. So a lot of interactions you will have with your colleagues, especially in other departments, it will be through the services. Okay. So if you if you look like you don't mind about doing the services, or if you're late at meetings, or you know, of course it will not be a good signal for for your colleagues, especially in uh, in the other departments where maybe you don't have much interaction with them on a on a daily basis otherwise. Okay, so do the job, do it seriously, and uh, I think it's also important to be collegial. And ideally, you also want to be proactive. Uh, you want to work on committees which are not too time consuming and, and fit with your personal interest. Okay, I think it's also important to, to be aware of, of the importance of services like that as, a, as an assistant prof. So five years is a short time. Uh, you know, uh, we're using a lot the metaphor of the clock, the tenure clock. I think it's, uh, it's it also explains why it can be stressful, okay? That's why it's critical to focus on time management, to develop some routines to be efficient. Uh, for instance, you should give yourself deadlines, block of time to focus on writing, maybe, you know, like uh, specific slots in your schedule or like uh, every every, um, every Monday morning, maybe you can say, okay, I look at my schedule, I look at my uh, at the meetings and my courses I have I have this week, you know, what kind, uh, what kind of block of time I can, uh, I can, I can save for my, for my writing. Okay, and you have also to learn what works and what doesn't work for you. And I think it takes time, you know, to be aware of uh, maybe you know uh, some of your limitations. For instance, what I have learned over, over the last few years is that I'm very bad at working after lunch. Uh, so I usually don't even try to work after lunch, and I usually take a big break between lunch and, and 3 p.m. Or I do like something which is doesn't require a lot of attention, like maybe you know checking my emails or maybe some, most of the time, not, nothing, okay? So uh, maintaining motivation is, uh, is one of the biggest challenges. Uh, you will probably face a lot <laughs> uh, of rejections and this is normal. I think it's part of the job. Uh, you need a tough skin to be, <laughs> to be a professor or uh, and an especially an assistant prof. Uh, and to make it a bit easier, I think it helps a lot to work with other people to get support. It can be your former supervisor, uh, former colleagues from your PhD program, um, you know, other other assistant profs in your institutions, you know, whatever. But I think personally, at least, I think I think it helps a lot. And also, I think it helps to keep in mind the big picture and, and also what excites you in, in the first place about, about your research. You know, uh, what kind of big issue you uh, you want to, to resolve and, uh, and, and address. So I said earlier that uh, five years is a short time, but it's also a long time. Uh, so be sure to take care of yourself, to get regular exercise, to mind relationships after all. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> this is just a job. So don't try to work 15 hours a day. Uh, in my opinion, good writing requires quality time. And if you can keep, let's say, three hours a day for writing without interruption, in my, in my opinion, this is already very good. Okay, don't try to do too much and, uh, you know, ah, I, <laughs> I have to write two papers by, by midnight or <laughs> I will die. Okay. Uh, and finally, keep in mind that you cannot control everything. Uh, there is a part of luck in, uh, in paper acceptance. Uh, there is also sometimes a political or personal dimension in the tenure decision. So being a university professor is a great job and tenure gives you academic freedom. And, and when you think at the origin of tenure, you know, in the Middle Ages and, and, and so on, like uh, several centuries ago, you know, at the, the starting point was to give you academic freedom. And I think it's, uh, it's also important to keep that in mind. So my personal philosophy is, was to do my best, but also not to stress too much about it. And one day I hope that you will be able to do that. Uh, and of course, you know, don't forget to enjoy the track. 
I think it's uh, it's my final word. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any any questions? Thank you so much, Fabrice, for sharing your insights. I want to start the Q and A part off with a question about juggling research, juggling services, but also juggling teaching, because you have seen have shown us that there are actually those three important parts. But I always wonder about because of course we shouldn't underestimate the services aspect, but research is one very, very important aspect in the end that we are then graded on. And I always wonder, do you have best practices on how to actually balance them? Also the teaching aspect, which takes up a lot of time to make sure that we still have enough time to focus on our research. So are there any best practices that you can share with us and the other participants in here on how really to balance the teaching with research and services? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question, and um, my personal viewpoint, and, uh, and you know, maybe some colleagues have different opinions, but I think is to be very careful about your time and to be very organized. Like uh, if I have to develop, like let's say a new class, maybe I will devote like uh, four half days and that's it. So don't try to be too perfectionist with your teaching materials, you know, with refining every single slide. Um, usually students don't know what you, what, what you don't talk about. So maybe you're going to feel bad or maybe I should have added an, an extra example or maybe uh, found an extra video and so on. But you know, it, it's endless. So again, you need to stop somewhere to say, okay, I'm going to devote this amount of time. So try of course to be realistic. And, and then that's it, you, you move on. Uh, I would say uh, it, it, regarding teaching, it would be my my main piece of advice. Okay, thank you. And then also regarding research, because you oftentimes don't just have one project in the pipeline, but you have several ones because you need to have that once in the end. So do you have best practice on how to juggle various projects at the same time and still making sure that you can go to the holy grail of getting tenure and not being lost in just managing projects without being successful in it? Yeah, I think it's probably one of the main challenges when you have like different projects, you have sometimes pressure for, from co-authors or sometimes co-authors and especially senior co-authors who, who don't reply to email or are very late to reply and, and, and you know, to, uh, to revise the draft. So managing uh, other people is also uh, a skill to learn. I, I, I'm sure I still have a lot, lot to learn, to, uh, a, lot, a lot to learn about it. Uh, I think it's what helps is to clarify the expectations, you know, when you start a new project. You know, uh, uh, okay, you're going to be in charge mostly of this part, maybe, I don't know, like uh, uh, framing the paper, writing the introduction, you maybe as an assistant prof, you know, you, the project is about your data set, like your dissertation data set, and you're going to be in charge of the statistical analysis, um, and maybe helping with writing the hypothesis. So, of, of course, it's, it has to be flexible, but I think it helps a lot to, to, to clarify, okay, who is going to be in charge of what? Also, to something else, which I think is important, is to clarify the order of authorship. Uh, uh, I think it's, um, it, it's, sometimes it's difficult to talk about it because, you know, you don't want to, to break the momentum and you don't want to, uh, uh, you know, to, to develop a bad relationship, especially with senior people or with your former supervisor. But it's also like, you know, um, we are professional, so it's, it's, it's part of the things we need to discuss. So talk about it. It doesn't mean that it's set in stone and it doesn't have to change. Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes after revise and submit, maybe some co-authors will, will have like a very big input and it makes sense, you know, to change the order of, of authorship. But, but managing your co-author, managing the expectations uh, helps a lot. Um, of course, prior prioritizing the revise on the summits. Uh, it sounds a bit like a cliche, but I think it's also very important uh, because time flies, <laughs> especially when uh, during your maybe your, your first two years when you have to develop new courses, new preps. It's very time consuming, or you have to, to deal with a lot of different expectations. So prioritizing the revise and the submits, be sure that you submit before the deadline. Like as you, as you, as you know, in, in many journals, you have sometimes like only three months or four months to resubmit. So it's very, very fast, uh, especially when you work with other people and you're waiting for some, for some feedback. So um, 
I would say it's uh, it's my main suggestion regarding regarding research. Okay, thank you. What I liked during your talk very much was your method metaphor of using gardening. And I think, especially if we're starting with a PhD, then you have already some little seeds into the ground and then you start growing the plants. Um, but then still, even though there is some success already, it still doesn't mean that you will be successful because the plant can still die. And so I always figured out that many struggle with the, yeah, let's say the track, the tenure track and getting tenure. So from your perspective, what are common mistakes or common mis understandings that happen to junior assistant professors that are very common? I would say it's to try to do too much, like to start too many new projects. Um, you know, especially when you're in a research oriented institution, you, 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 most of the time you have a lot of pressure. And, and, and you know you you're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. You have a paper under review. You're going to face rejects uh, and rejections. I think it's again. I don't know anyone who has not faced a rejection and a lot of rejections. Um, so I think it helps to have a portfolio, but not a portfolio which is too large. Um, again, depending on your institution, depending on also on your, your 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 teaching activities and the number of courses you have for. As an assistant prof, uh, you know, you have to look at the objectives, the goals to get in your new institutions and maybe have one or two extra projects, but that's it. Uh, don't, don't try like to have 10 projects because as you know, when you're on the job market, you know, it's like, it's cross-sectional. People look at your CV when you're on the job market at one specific point and it's the same for the tenure package. You know, uh, uh, at the very beginning of your sixth year, uh, after you start in your new job, people will look at your packets and they will okay, look at, okay, how many publications do you have? Okay, OSMJ, two work science, one GIPS, okay, it counts, it doesn't count. <laughs> and some, some institutions, it's very much about, okay, how many do you have? Okay, do you check the box? And it, it's sometimes binary, yes or no. In some institutions, people are more flexible. They may look also to revise and resubmit especially like if it's a second revise and resubmit or third revise and resubmit, you know, it can be a, a positive signal about your potential and okay, maybe you don't have the, the number, like the magical number, but you have several papers under advanced stage of reviews. So it, it also helps because at the end of the day, you know, you, um, uh, you, you have your colleagues, you, usually it's uh, all the tenured people in your, in your school making a decision and voting about your case. So most of the time there is no official requirements or official, uh, you know, <laughs> standards, uh, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, but, you know, people have, you know, some expectations in mind. Okay, in my school, it's maybe like, let's say, five publications in this kind of journals, and they're going to look at your profile and make a decision based on that. Okay. All right, thank you. Was there, if I can ask something very specific to you, um, was there something that you say now, looking back to your tenure time? Um, do you think there was something in specific that you would do differently now, knowing everything that you know, or would you do everything the same? Well, basically, most of the things I just presented, it may look straightforward, but it took me like several years to learn about it. And again, uh, again uh, it's, it's, it's a learning process. I, <laughs> I, I, I'm still learning a lot about, you know, how to manage your co-authors or to manage revise and submit or to manage my schedule and so on. But um, I would say it's about, you know, being selective in the project you start, uh, knowing the expectations of your school, especially like if your school has a specific list of journals. Uh, and to give you an example, I, I published in, a, in, in, a, in journals like strategic organization, but at Purdue it, it just doesn't count. Like it, it, it's zero. <laughs> Some people may even say it's a, it has negative value, you know, because it's not a, a journal which is on the official list. So most of the time it's not that binary. You know, it counts, it doesn't count, but in some schools it, it is. Uh, so, you know, know the guidelines, know the expectations, know the rules of the game in your school and, and, and adjust the way you worked in function of those rules. Uh, I would say it's something maybe I, you don't know very well, and it's something I learned over the, over the years. You mentioned different schools and different systems. Um, if you're still in your PhD, you can already 
prepare certain, let's say, research paid pipelines for the later part for your tenure track positions. Um, are there anything or are there any papers or journals that we should already think planning about doing our PhD? Or just finish this marathon and then continue with the next marathon afterwards? Well, first, I think it helps to have a, a dissertation organizer around, around papers. Uh, I know in the US, I think it's a, it's a standard in most schools. In, in Europe, it depends on institutions. I think uh, in, in, in many, many good schools, I think it's, it's now like the norm to have like a dissertation in a, around, around, around papers. I think it, it helps a lot uh, to do that as a PhD student. And then, but again, it's my personal perspective and, and viewpoint, try to be ambitious about the journals. Uh, because what I have seen many times with junior colleagues is that they have like their job market papers, they have spent like sometimes several years working on this project. You know, it's, it, it's very personal, personal, it's very emotional. They submit to a journal, they, got, they get a reject and resubmit. Uh, and, and it's again, it's very emotional, and and, and sometimes they, they they can be depressed about it because uh, it, because of course it, it's very tough, you know, to get a reject on your work on some things where you have worked several years. Maybe you, many people have told you that you have done a good job. So being resilient, being able to uh, say, okay, I'm not going to think about it for one week, but next week, okay. I'm going to start again. I'm going to read the comments in detail. I'm going to really to pay attention to the details. Maybe I will, uh, I will ask some colleagues to also provide some feedbacks based on the reviewer's comments. I will really make some changes and then I will resubmit to another journal, okay? Uh, being able to go through this process and to be able to turn the page quickly on a, on a reject, I think it's, uh, it, it, it's something very important. Related to that, we have a question on the chat. Uh, of, uh, do you ever think in terms of trend in the research uh, when you select your, your project or, or not? Uh, because there is, at some point, there is maybe theory of element that it can be popular or fashion and, and it can be seen um, not in the, in the train. So how did you do that when you were in PhD and also in the uh, junior faculty? Um, personally, I don't really think about it, my, about my new project in this way, <laughs> because many projects, they take like four, five, seven, six, seven years to get published, you know, you know, the time to, to, to write the draft, to go to conferences, to get feedback, to present at seminars, to get some rejects, to try another journal, to go through three rounds of reviews, to get the reject, to try another journal and, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> so in six, seven years, the field may evolve sometimes quite quickly, uh, like six, seven years ago, people didn't talk about platforms to give you an example much, uh, you know, so maybe today people are going to talk about blockchain a lot. So is it trendy? Should you, you know, change your research agenda to work today on blockchains? Uh, maybe, maybe not. I, th I think what I, the way I select my project is what interests me personally. Uh, so it's partly very subjective. Uh, it also depends on uh, the people with whom I can work uh, because it's uh, doing research is a very social activity. You interact with co-thoughts for several years, sometimes several times a week, uh, especially over the last year and a half. We, <laughs> most of the social interactions we have had like, is, 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 uh, is with co-thoughts on Zoom and Skype and so on. So um, I think for me, it's one of the most important criteria when I select the project. Is it something I, I really want to do? Is it something also which has potential uh, to be published in a good journal and not necessarily, okay, is it trendy? Is it going to attract a lot of citations? Because you never really know in advance. Related to that, I had a question, like you say that your PhD was about um, the governance mechanisms in uh, uh, inter-organizational um, dispute and you, and after you expand it to informal and, and formal mechanisms and the dark side of the interorg, did you ever thought about it in your PhD? Or it was along the way during your junior faculty experiences. Right, it's a good question. I think I, I did my PhD and at the time I didn't have the research agenda I presented on my slide. I think it took me okay. many years or at least several years not to 
to become fully aware of, of this, of what I put on this slide. And to some extent, there is much exposed rationalization. <laughs> I said, okay, I have this set of papers. Now I have to make sense of this set of papers, <laughs> how to present what I have done over the last few years in a simple way. And I, I came up with this slide. Okay, okay, there is my dissertation at the center. And then there is one set of papers, mostly about governance mechanisms, like contract trust and, and the interplay between formal and informal mechanisms. On the other side, I have done some work on conflict, disputes, opportunism. So it was one way to organize my research. And then it also helped me a lot to, again, as I explained, like to guide me for new projects and to be selective in, a, in, a, in, in, in starting a new project. Okay, related to re starting new project, we have a question on the chat. Do you have some personal rules to evaluate if a research question for a new project is a good research question? Well, the simple answer is no, I don't. <laughs> um, well, I think the, to answer the question, I think you should make the distinction if, is it for you as an assistant prof or once you get tenure? I think, uh, as I explained previously, you know, especially after getting tenure, you're, you have more freedom, more flexibility about the kind of project you can start. So for instance, I started my project on, on blockchain governance after getting tenure um, because it was more risky, uh, it was a conceptual paper. Um, so the likelihood you know, to, um, to get a hit at the top journal was less likely. Uh, it ended up a talk science, but at the beginning, you know, there was much uncertainty about the outcome of the, of the paper. As an assistant prof, I would say, be more selective about, okay, does it have the potential to end up in a journal listed in my school, in your school? Okay, if the answer is no, uh, because it's uh, for, for different reasons, because data are kind of weak or the, 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 the question is too narrow or um, it's mostly uh, like, I don't know, it's the first time you, you write a conceptual paper and, uh, and you know, if you, if you miss uh, Academy of Management reviews, there is not many uh, alternative options. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have a good answer to this question, and it's still uh, it's still something I uh, I would like to know. <laughs> uh, yeah. But would you say that we should not, if we are on a tenure track, not focus on developing a conceptual paper and rather stick to let's say qualitative or quantitative research? I, I, I wouldn't say that. I, I think it's my personal situation. Uh, I have written a couple of conceptual papers, but it, it, it has really, it really took me several years to be able, you know, to take some distance with the literature, to have the maturity, you know, to be critical about what has been done and to be able, you know, to develop some new conceptual ideas. Uh, to, to me, it, it, it took several years. Some people may be very comfortable about writing, you know, an AMR type of paper. Um, so it depends on your preferences, on your style on um, you know the people with whom we are working it depends on different factors but in my personal situation uh, it's not something I, I would recommend for for my PhD students or, or when I think at my own situation as an assistant prof. Okay so I take away we should not necessarily focus on a conceptual paper but if we already started with a conceptual paper in the PhD time then we can probably better progress with that in the tenure track time. Yes, I mean, if you if you have made an investment and you, if you believe in the paper, you see some potential. Yes, I mean, don't uh, you know? Don't waste your, your your previous effort and especially what you have done in your dissertation. You know, ideally, with your dissertation, you have like three main chapters. It would be three papers you publish in, in good journals. Uh, it of course it doesn't always work this way. Uh, so sometimes, especially like some. So some, some schools, they have a tradition of writing two empirical papers, one conceptual paper, or two, two empirical papers, one review paper. So yes, I would say if, if it's the way you have developed your dissertation, try you know, to, uh, uh, to, to publish those papers. Uh, it can be two empirical, one conceptual, or two empirical, one review. Uh, but uh, if it's what you have done for your dissertation, do it, do it as well as an assistant process. During your presentation, you talk about the importance of external reviewers. And in the chat, there is a question like, how can we secure 
external letters for this uh, reviewer, and I have also one. You say that it will be better that it, it, the external reviewer should be not people that you work like former colleagues or former mentors. So if we, we don't know the people quite well, how we can approach them? Yeah, it's, it's also a very good question. So, so first of all, sometimes in, uh, in many schools, you, you have like strict rules about who you cannot contact. Uh, in my understanding, in most schools, you know, uh, you're not allowed to contact your former supervisors or former professors from the institutions where you got your PhD, or if it's not your first job as an assistant prof, you know, uh, former colleagues in your former institution. Uh, also, most of the time, you're not allowed to contact other assistant professors or post PhD students. Uh, depending on school, sometimes you may be allowed to contact associate professors. In some of those schools, it's only full professors, okay? As I also explained, sometimes you, you need to contact people in schools which are at least as good as your own institution. So I remember when I was an assistant prof and I asked some colleagues, okay, is it fine to contact people in advance? I received two very different um, suggestions and opinions. Some colleagues told me, no, 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 don't do that. It would be deontological, on, on, sorry, on, anti-deontological to do that. I was a bit surprised, but uh, it's uh, you know, very senior people who, who told me that. At the same time, some of the people said, yeah, 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 sure, you should, <laughs> you should try to contact people in advance and, and, and try to, to ask if they, are, if they are ready to write a letter for you. Um, so I would say, ask your colleagues, ask your head of department if it's fine to contact people in advance. But more broadly, my suggestion would be, you know, go to conferences, meet with people, don't hesitate to introduce yourself, uh, especially, you know, don't be shy to talk with senior people uh, working in your, in your area, in, in, on, on, on your topics, because, um, you know, you, you may need them in some ways at some point. So uh, senior people know that it's part of the expectation. They, uh, they, most of the time they won't be, they wouldn't be surprised if they receive such a, such a request. Uh, but the request has to go through your school, usually like the, your dean or your head of department. You make the list, you give the list to your head of the department, and then the head of the department, they, they contact the people on your list. D does it answer your questions? Uh, yes, for me, I think, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. let, let us know, and I think for the chat also, so it's fine. Um, do you have any advice uh, on how to find a mentor in the new department? Because you say that it could be important to have one in your department. So do you have any thought and advice to how to find it? So in, in many schools, it's uh, it's kind of an official process. Um, in some of the schools, they, they don't have that. So just simply, you know, um, meet with your colleagues, especially, you know, like the senior colleagues, um see if you have like a good personal relationship with those people and just ask them simply okay would you would you agree to meet with me maybe like to have a lunch every month and to talk about my career my progress some some tips and tricks about uh you know uh, publishing and and so on and so forth so it can be someone in your institution or it can be someone outside your institution ideally you know you want to have like some kind of uh, of small network of people who can guide you on a regular basis it can be your, your, your PhD supervisor, some other colleagues, some, some co-authors and so on. But I think it helps a lot also like to, to get some more, some uh, emotional support when you, when, uh, when you get some rejects. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you have a particular approach yourself, uh, do you have, sorry, do you have a particular approach of yourself and advice for how to go about choosing co-authors? Uh, well, it's a mix of different factors, you know, um, you can think about it in a very cold and rational way. It's okay, we're making a project, what do I bring, what do you bring, okay? And when you think at uh, junior people, like it can be PhD students or like uh, junior assistant professors, usually your main resources, your main advantages is good data, uh, a willingness to work very long hours, uh, usually, you know, like the latest statistical techniques or like you know, the latest methodological approaches. And usually if you work with more senior people, they, 
they know the journal, they know how to navigate the revise and resubmit, they know how to frame a paper, they know, uh, you know, how to, to, to choose an editor or to, to suggest an editor. And uh, it's definitely not the same amount of work most of the time, but it's about, okay, who brings what to the project? Okay, you can think about it this way. Or I think another important factor, and uh, in my opinion, it's critical is that, as I said, you, you, when you start a project, it's often for several years, sometimes like six, seven years. So don't work with anyone. <laughs> Work with people where, with whom you can you can you can have like a, a good relationship. You can address some potential conflicts. You can uh, you can have an argument. You can disagree openly. Uh, you can say no, I, I disagree. No, I I I I, I, uh, I think here you're right, or here I think you're wrong. So um, it's not possible to do that with anyone. But I think it's also part of how you should select people with whom you you're going to work. Related to the section of the co-author, uh, we have also a question related to the section of the uh, the journal. Um, how do you pick your your outlet for for a project? Do you do you think about the time of uh, publication because some journal can be faster than the other one, or how do you how do you choose them? Um, well, the, when when you look at the Top journals like the usual suspect, like in, in strategic management, you have SMJ, Arc Science, uh, SQ, and JMR, or even like if you include maybe journal of management, I would say it's pretty much the same. You may have some some variants, but then it depends on the editors and the review team. Uh, what I observed, but it, again, it may be like uh, very idiosyncratic over the last few months. I, I have had some papers on the review like for seven or eight months. Uh, and I know it can be a disaster when you're in the tenure track, you know, you, you want to revise and submit, you want the publication. Uh, but I would say it's not the way I select journals. Um, again, it depends on what's going to be important for your school to get tenure. If there is an official list of journals that counts officially, you know, it's how you should select journals. Uh, like I, I saw a question in the chat between AMR and AMJ. Is there a difference in terms of timeline? As far as I know, I don't think so. I don't have much experience with AMR, but uh, from what I heard and from what I've experienced, it, if you want to go in AMR, you have also to go like through <laughs> at least three rounds of reviews most of the time. So it, it takes several years. So it's, it's, I would say it's pretty similar to, to AMJ. I have a question related to, to, the, to the journal. Do you, think about the journal before writing your project? Like, do you write a research idea regarding what kind of outlet do you want or do you do the opposite? Like you write and you will see where we can. Again, it's, it's my personal approach. I'm not sure it's the best one. <laughs> Usually I start the project and then when I have a draft, I, I, I or, or almost a draft, I start thinking, okay, what, what's the best target for the journal. Uh, and sometimes I make slight modifications. Uh, maybe, you know, SMJ is more like phenomenon oriented. Uh, MJ, of course, is more theory oriented. So it, it may have some implications for the way you frame the paper and so on. But um, it's not something which is really driving how I write paper or and so on. So yeah, so that's my answer to this question. Thank you. Uh, we have another question on the chat. Uh, according to your experience, how important is the acquisition of third party found on the tenure process? I think you also yeah, think thought it, about it, the grant. Yeah, I think it depends on your institutions. Uh, I, I, to give you my personal example, at Purdue, I think it's, uh, it's close to zero. <laughs> uh, it's, nobody has told me, uh, okay, you should get grants or you should get third party funds. Uh, okay, of course, if you get some, great, good for you, but it's not something important. You know, we, in, in many schools, you have like internal research budgets and most of the time it's plenty enough uh, you know, to, to, to go to conferences. Maybe if you need to buy a specific data sets, in many schools, you have a specific budget, you can make a request. 
sometimes also you like you have internal grants. Like I remember in Australia, we had every year like a specific system of internal grants. It was competitive, but not that competitive. So it's not, not a big criterion to make a distinction between uh, between people like to get uh, to get tenure. At the same time, this being said, in some other countries, I know in, in Canada, I, I know like one of my former PhD students is in Canada now, and getting a grant, uh, a specific grant for junior scholar, is almost part of the official requirement to get tenure. Or when I remember in, in Australia, there's like different types of grants, uh, especially again, grants for junior scholars, and getting a grant can be sometimes an official requirement or sometimes a big plus. Like sometimes almost the equivalent of a top publication in a in a in a, in a good journal. Um, so to, to to repeat myself, it, I think it depends on your institution and what's important in your school. I actually wonder. We are always now, of course, in a pandemic, and we have been for the last uh, nearly one and a half quarter year. Um, I always wonder those are that are currently on the tenure track and are more towards the five years. Do you have any recommendations on how to survive the tenure track during these difficult times? Well, first I know that in many schools, uh, candidates were supposed to apply this year, they, they, they got an extension of one year. Uh, and I think it, 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 in many cases, it makes a lot of sense. I think it was, in most of the time, it was optional. People had the, the option you know, to, to apply during this year or to wait for, for next year. Um, so it's one thing to keep in mind. I don't know if schools will do the same next year. Um, in, in, uh, in my previous school or my new school, I, I, I don't I don't know about it. Uh, I, I know it's tough. I, uh, I talked about my personal experience with some journals recently, like some papers under review, like for six, seven months. Um, sometimes you can try to contact the editor. Most of the time, it doesn't help because they may have difficulties to find reviewers or reviewers are slow. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I, I don't have very good pieces of advice. I know teaching is more challenging. Um, you know, in many schools, you have teaching sometimes <laughs> in the classroom and on Zoom at the same time. So it's uh, it's, it's something new for, for many of us and uh, it's new skills, new new resources you need to acquire. So I think it's something you can report in your application package, and uh, when when you will apply for tenure, you know I have to uh, to develop new new specific resources, especially with courses in a hybrid mode on Zoom and the classroom, and uh, hopefully it will be, it will it, it um, people will look at that and and take that into consideration. Well, that's excellent because I think many that are currently on the uh, on the tenure track are stressed out as are those as well that are in the job market. And I think um, you always have in mind that it takes some time to get your paper published, but nobody saw this pandemic coming and nobody thought about that you need to even prepare for more time to actually get the results. So yes, it's difficult well, time. At the same time, again, you, especially when, when, when referees are contacted, keep in mind that you will be compared with people from your cohort. Like let's say you get you got your PhD two years ago, so when you will apply for 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 tenure, like in three or four years, uh, the referees will say, okay, oh, when I look at uh, Anne Catherine, she got her PhD, let's say in uh, in 2019. What about the other people who also got their PhD in 2019? You know, and I it's it's too early to say if there is if there will be like a, a, an impact on all the profession and all the assistant profs. And maybe you know your cohort will have relatively less publications or more publications. I don't, I don't know, uh, but again, you will be compared like with, with people who got their PhD like uh, the, the same year. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have maybe the time for another question. If the the judge sure. wants to, to to ask another question, but if no, I have one. Um, uh, you say that there is a lot of informal rules uh, to get uh, to have the requirement of education to, to have a tenure track. How do you succeed to know these informal rules? Again, like talking with people um, in, your, in both in your department and in other departments, uh, because 
keep in mind that in most schools, the way it works is that you have different committees. Uh, so usually, you know, at the end of your fifth year, at the end of the summer, you will have to to, to send your, your, your tenure packet. Uh, then in, let's say, September, October, October you have the first committee. Uh, then in around December, you have the second committee. And then at the end of the academic year, usually in April, you know, uh, the, whole, uh, the, the whole process and the whole application has to be approved by, uh, by the, the, the president of the university or, or maybe the board of trustees or something like that. So you have different hurdles, different steps. So especially for the second committee, it's, it's going to be a vote involving people in your area, in your department, but also people in other departments, let's say people in finance, in OB, in accounting and so on. So also talk with your colleagues, especially like tenured people. Uh, okay, what do you think about it? Tell me about the recent cases, the recent candidates, uh, what were the strengths of the candidate, what were the weaknesses of the candidates? Uh, so I think it, it, it's very useful to, to know those rules of the game, and especially the implicit and informal ones. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, think, I think we don't have a question anymore. So thank you so much uh, for your you time. Will. Thank you all for, for, your, for being here today with us.